My name's Andy Touch. Um, that is my last name, and people do make jokes, so <laughs> that's cool. Yep, Mr. Touch, Dr. Touch, yeah, so on and so forth. Um, so I am uh, EMEA product evangelist for Unity Technologies, and I'm like the only one. So I basically cover Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa, and deal with talks and new customers, existing customers, support the sales guys, basically the technical side of sales and stuff like that. Um, I deal more with like the front facing part of the engine. So for example, the products people are going to be using, like new tools coming out, current tools that's just been released, uh, platforms that been, get, people are going to be used to build to, and I do demos or presentations of things coming out in the future or things that have just recently come out. Um, I work with field engineers and the core developers of the engine, so they talk about the nitty gritty, deep and dirty, rendering, hardcore stuff, other language type stuff, um, and I deal with more sort of like the, the product as a whole. Um, I have Twitter and I take pictures of my cat and stuff, I moan about the weather, um, and the queue in the post office, and yeah, and I have an email as well, so you can email it to me. So, um, it's split into two days, so day one agenda is basically establishing core fundamentals of Unity. Um, and this is going to build up everything from an intro to basically we're going to make some games and uh, one or two interactive bits and pieces and have lots of fun with this. So I've got a lot of stuff on the agenda um, planned. It seems a little ambitious, but we'll get through it all. Don't worry. So who's used Unity before? Okay, cool. So who's used it like and made a game and released a game with it? Okay, cool. Who's who doesn't even know what Unity is, and they just sort of got on a coach, and then now here, and they're like, oh, oh no, I actually have to code and stuff. Okay, cool. That's all right. <laughs> That's cool. So day one, we're basically going to do a ground up intro to Unity. And this is going to cover basically everything that you would need to know to make a game. So it's going to cover everything from materials, shaders, textures, lighting types, audio, physics, making bouncy physics materials, objects, components, input, importing assets. Uh, Loads of scripting stuff, different input methods, particles. If we get onto it, 2D tools, sprite sheet animation, animator, all this stuff which you would basically need to build a game, a easy game, do stuff like that. Then tomorrow, we'll be going through a lot of mobile stuff. So basically, we'll take what we've done today, and then if you're really hardcore and you really want to work on more of it tonight and so on and so forth and add some more pretty pictures and things to it, you can do. And then we're building it to uh, Windows 8. Uh, Metro app or whatever it's called, um, building it through that and then doing all the tiles and bits and pieces. Um, then we'll do some mobile stuff and then build like a little mobile game with different types of inputs and things like that. So yeah, we should be able to build to those things by the end of these two days, which is cool. Um, so yeah, a bit about Unity. So Unity does a whole bunch of stuff, but like I'd probably say like 80% of its time is spent, spent making a game engine. So making a product, making an editor, which people will be able to go in, author some form of game or materials, gather assets from other applications, and then publish it to the platforms that they choose to. Um, start to go into game publishing. Um, that's handled over in America. Uh, I don't know too much about that. It's kind of like they operate as like their own lone wolf like unit. But basically, they're taking games under their wing, go through businessy side of things, releasing a game, monetization, how to get money, and things like that. I also do support packages, so for customers who perhaps need a bit more help or want more help, or they want direct contact to the engineers of the engine, they can take out support packages for that sort of thing. And training consultancy, and we have a pretty cool community who are very vibrant and diverse, as I'll talk about in a bit. Um, yeah, so we haven't got that many employees for our reach. We've got about 340-ish. I think I was employee number 301, so I joined a day late um, to be number 300. We have 17 offices. Now that's actual building bits that are rented by the company. Um, satellite offices, it would be, uh, I don't know, probably in the hundreds, maybe, yeah, probably more, 150 or so. Basically people who live, work out of home or box rooms and things like that. So. Technically, my spare room is the London Unity office ish. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so 17 ish offices, and those are dotted all around the world, but the majority of the core development is done in Copenhagen, um, but the head office is in San Francisco. Um, I don't know why it's like that. So, we've got 2.3 million registered developed. That, that number's probably gone up it's, since I did these slides. Uh, 200 ish million web player installs. Um, we see how that is by the end of 2014 when Google go a bit mad and cancel loads of stuff. 
Cool. Yeah, and yeah, bit of a mad community. So yeah, um, so Unity, we love our community. I'm not sure if that's how the name came about, community. I, I don't know. Um, but basically, we have Unity forums, so people can discuss what they're making. They say, here is a, a game I'm making, things like that. Could I get some feedback? And um, everyone in the company also goes on those forums and interacts with them that way. So the 2D engineers are like, oh, this is pretty cool. You know, I'll share it or, you know. Uh, Unity answers as well, which is more like a Stack Overflow type thing. So people can ask, how, how do I use the terrain tool for this particular thing? People do it. Unity user groups, um, which are like regular monthly meetups. I'm not sure if there's a one in Finland, but like the London one gets like 200 people every month. And we get developers come, they give talks about their products, what they're working on, Oculus Rift, all sorts of things. Then everyone goes to the pub afterwards and everyone likes that bit. Um, Google Plus Hangouts, so this is like regular thing. So when 2D tools are announced and released, um, there's a Google Plus Hangout where the Learn team would construct all the Learn tutorials, plus all the actual 2D engineers are on Google Plus. So you could just literally pose questions to them and interact with the actual guys who made the tools. Um, so there's broadcast live training. There's one, I think, last night, and the guy for an hour, it was, uh, Mike was doing basically some training, um, broadcast for free, and got something like 1,200 people just just sitting in and just following along with them and stuff, which is quite cool. And we have asset store, so people can sell assets, buy assets. Um, a lot of people quit their jobs so they can just sell stuff on the asset store. We've hired people from the asset store as well because they're pretty awesome what they do. Uh, yep, yeah, basically what I just said. Yeah, so yeah, you can buy assets, sell assets, get hired by Unity. So we've hired quite a few people from the asset store um, to come work on our engine and stuff, so that's quite cool. That's quite nice. Uh, yeah. Sweet. So, yeah, uh, one of the core goals of Unity is to authorize the play over, which is a kind of leading into sort of the point of what this whole sort of two days is about, which is to support the Windows phone, support Windows platforms and Windows 8 and so on and so forth like that. So with Auth once deploy everywhere, um, sometimes, sometimes people still get a bit confused by this. And that's the case, so you bring all your assets in, so your FBX models, your PSDs, your, uh, I don't know, movie clips, your audio and things like that. You then create your game and then you just have a drop down list of what you want to build to. There are obviously platform specific things. So for example, push notifications on one mobile platform will be different to push notifications on another one. But those are all minor things that you can tweak and play around with. Um, but the core development of your game, the core bulk of your product is made. You just need to tweak it for those specific um, things. So yeah, you don't have to rebuild your entire game from scratch, so on and so forth, uh, if you're using other stuff. So yeah, uh, web has anyone got like a screen set up like this? <laughs> Does your eyes hurt or? I don't know, yeah. That's quite mad. Uh, cool. So, yeah, uh, support desktop apps of web player, standard applications, Facebook SDK, Steam, uh, gaming portals, uh, Windows Phone, Android, OS, Blackberry, Tizen. Um, does anyone use the Tizen? <laughs> no? Okay, cool. And um, many more. There's loads in like the Chinese market that, I, that just list goes on and on and on. Console build platforms. So some of these are out and some of these are not out yet. So the Xbox, building to Xbox 360, PS3, Wii U, Ouya, um, or Ouya, whatever it may be, um, is all already out. The other ones are in development. So Xbox One is in development and so on and so forth with the other ones. So that'd be quite cool. Uh, yeah, support peripherals. So Oculus Rift. I like that face because <laughs> it's not me. I can't grow a beard as awesome as that. Uh, yeah, so Oculus Rift, Leap Motion, these are things that you can plug in. So instead of just having an input of touching a screen or using a mouse and keyboard and stuff, there are basically other ways for the old users to interact with your game. Arduino, so I saw this amazing first person shooter where it was like cardboard cutouts of. Uh, it was, he was a lecturer and he made a game, and all these students were like cardboard cutouts that popped up, and you shot your stu his students, which seems very strange. And then afterwards, what it would do is then it would show like a little mini shooting gallery where they'd all pop up all the students that he actually got in the game. Um, yeah, it was quite weird, but basically, he was taking a thing from the game and putting it in. And also, the light in the game was dependent on the light in his room, so when he turned off his light, all the lights in the game turned out and stuff. So basically, he's using Arduino like light sensors and things like that to bring content in and push content out. Um, oh yeah, a couple of games. So yeah, Bad Piggies. Um, so you've all heard of Angry Birds. That wasn't made in Unity, but Bad Piggies was. 
Um, so Rovio basically used Unity and they tricked it into being like a 2D um, engine um, because they wanted to use the physics and basically try, try it out. Um, yeah, so Bad Piggies is amazing. It's pretty cool. Lego Star Wars Yoda Chronicles. So yeah, this is uh, made by ex-console developers. Um, so they used to make games for PS2 and Tomb, they made Tomb Raider and stuff like that. And they now use Unity instead to make Lego Star Wars games. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, you fly your ships around, blow stuff up. Um, so this was made by one guy, and he released this game for free. So you just roll the ball down, uh, this Helter Skelter, which is procedurally generated. You basically just have to get as far as possible without falling off. But if you do fall off, you can like flick it, so you can like get back on the track. It's quite a mad game, but it's made by one guy, and he sold tons and tons of copies. Kerbal Space Program. So who's played this game? It is awesome. I used to live with a guy who, who he'd come home from work, he was a web designer, come home from work, just boot up a Kerbal Space Program, and on one screen he'd have this game, the other screen had like rocket science, he's trying to learn rocket science to play this game, which is quite amazing. So in this game, basically, you control this little frogman called Kerbin, I'm not making this up, um, and your goal is to conquer space, so you build rockets and stuff like this, like, like Lego, you build all the struts and all the different elements. You do all the input mm -hmm. controls and things like that. So at this point, rockets are going to boost off from the right or the left. And you have to land on the moon, but then you have to design your rockets so you can then take off of the moon and then land back on um, uh, Kerbin or uh, the planet. And then you have to basically conquer space. And you can zoom right into these little dudes in the ship and then zoom right out and view the whole galaxy. And it's quite amazing how they did all this. And uh, uh, Unity, the, I think our CTO or someone in the technical side of creating the engine, invited them to come give a talk about how they overcome these things at like our conference in Canada, which is quite cool. And they're giving lots of insights. Caves Castle Story. So yeah, not Minecraft um, or like Lemmings or whatever it may be, but you just control these little dudes, and it's made by four guys and. All of this is completely interactive, so you can play some TNT at the bottom and then blow up all these guys' work and all the different blocks will like scatter and tumble down the hill. Um, I like showing the screenshots to people who have no idea what this game is, because it's very Who doesn't know what Surgeon Simulator is? You all do? Or? Okay, so yeah, it's made in 48 hours, um, and they put it... Uh, by four guys made it in 48 hours for this company and they just put it on um, on like they just hosted a link and it got millions and millions of downloads and all it is is you just control a hand you have to put, perform surgery but it's the worst control scheme it's like quap but instead of walking in a straight line you have to perform heart surgery like so one of the hardest things that you've got to do with what's on the worst control so you control all the fingers by pushing keys it, you have physics and basically you pick up like um, a saw to get through like the bones, but then you actually drop the saw, it goes out the back door of an ambulance, and then you have to like use other things like an alarm, and yeah, and basically the game sort of escalates from there, and it's incredibly difficult. Um, so they made that in 48 hours, got millions of downloads. Um, they then remade it in 48 days, and then they got talking with Valve, and Valve wanted to put like TF2 characters in it, Team Fortress 2 characters, yeah. and just sent them a load of stuff, and they're just, yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool game. They're making like an iPad version, but the first role of the iPad version, the controls were too accurate and people were solving all the surgeries too quickly and too efficiently, so they're kind of making the controls worse, which is kind of a backwards way of going about <laughs> making a game where you have the controls too good and too accurate, so they're now making them slightly worse. Yeah, very bizarre. Uh, yeah, Kentucky Route Zero is like a 2D side scroll. It's a very beautiful game. Um, <coughs> it's very nice. So, so this is actually made in Finland, uh, Supernauts, and by Grand Crew. Do you guys know Grand? So those of you from Finland. No one's from Finland. Okay, cool. So by Grand Crew. So it's like a social. I'm not going to say the word, the game that they're probably fed up with that. But basically, you fly in your rocket to other people's worlds. You basically build up the worlds by placing blocks and cubes and things like that. And all the cubes sort of form <laughs> round. So for example, the bricks build a curved wall as opposed to a uniform wall. And I can go into my brother's world and grief him and leave a massive hole in the middle of his planet. And then he gets really annoyed and then come to my room and do the same. Um, yeah, so Christmas is interesting when I see him, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a pretty cool game. You can wander around and build, basically build whatever you want and you save people by building bridges and stuff, so that's cool. Uh, the Room, so not that movie, the, the, the terrible movie. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. It's, it's awful. But actually the game, you, you zoom in on the iPad and you zoom in and you can 
complete all these puzzles and all these different things and it's like a massive combination like you have to push buttons and so on and so forth but it's very visually impressive um, Tesla Grad so I only heard about this game the other day and I met one of the developers on the Xbox One ID event basically they just made this game in 2D it's like eight guys but they're releasing on on all of the consoles like he, I was like so what are you releasing it's like oh Steam then all the consoles it's like specifically and he was like this, 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 Wii U, Xbox One, da 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 And I was like, oh, so all of them, you actually meant it. So it's quite amazing that a little company is able to release uh, their little 2D platformer on all the games consoles, which is quite awesome. Yeah, NASA. So NASA basically got the height map data on Mars and then made a thing in the browser where you could drive the rover around to explore Mars. It's not that interesting to explore um, because it's just the beach, I guess, but less water. Um, but yeah, that's pretty cool that NASA's using Unity to visualize stuff. It's quite awesome. You basically you can drive it around and plot all these points out. Um, so yeah, uh, so yeah, so that's kind of like a mix of different things made with Unity. That's not everything that's visually impressive or technically impressive and things like that. It's just kind of a mix of uh, sort of a rough overview of sort of the games that are made with it or the applications made with it. And, and people always ask me, you know, the engine's quite open in the sense that you're not told you have to make a driving game, you have to make a first person shooter and so on and so forth. Um, they always ask what's sort of like the most different game you different game you made other than Surgeon Simulator? And I'd probably say it's this one. So it's like Boulder's Gate, but you're a washing machine. And what you do is you just wander around with a lance and not sword and shoot, and you just kill goblins and orcs as if you're just a normal normal mite. And it's just quite crazy. Like the guy in a dev blog was like, Oh yeah, so yeah, I, I was going to make a standard top-down sword fighting game against ogres and things. I just thought, let's make a washing machine because it's actually a talking point. And yeah, but the game can please, plays exactly like Baldur's Gate. So it's quite bizarre all the things people make with it, which is quite cool. Um, yeah. So yeah, we've actually done one of these things now, which is quite cool. Um, <laughs> we're getting through the list, so that's all right. So let's do some Unity stuff. So, do you all have Unity installed? That would be useful. Okay, cool. So, what I want you to do is... Open up Unity, and you should get... Okay. Uh... Okay. So, and what I want you to do is I want you to go to File, New Project. So yeah, File, New Project to the top. And you come to this Project Wizard. So we're going to create a brand new project. So you might already have a project where you've gone in and made some cubes bounce around or something, or made a shooting game in like a day, or whatever it may be. Um, but what you're going to do is we're going to set up a brand new project. So I want you to set that to a location which is useful for you. So I know I'm probably the only Mac user in the room. Oh, no, there's one over there. That's cool. Um, and so I'm just going to stick it on my desktop and I'm going to call this Fruit Splat and set up defaults for it's going to be a 3D game um, and we don't need to import any packages just yet and I'm just going to create that project so what Unity will do is it will close down or it will open up for the first time and we should it will make that folder called Fruit Splat and you should have something that looks very simple and very basic like this Complete new project, there's nothing in here, it's all from scratch. Cool, so, uh, yeah, so some of this might be familiar, some of this might not. So, put your hands up again if you've used Unity before, or you've at least dabbled in it. Okay, cool. So, it might still be useful for me to go through basically how the editor and how the interface works from the ground up. Like, I did this talk. Um, well, they, these two days of training to like London Microsoft people, or the UK Microsoft team, and even though some of them had already shipped like four games, I was pointing out things they never knew before in Unity. So it would still be quite useful for me to go through all this from scratch. So this is the idea. This is basically the editor that you create and construct your game in. So I'm going to talk about The Sims quite a lot in this talk. Not because I like The Sims, or I, you know, I have my little family that I have to check in and make sure they're okay and. They're doing well in their careers and they haven't died yet and things like that. Simply because um, the Sims level builder is a good indicator of how this scene works. You have your 3D scene, you have all your assets around the outside that construct up your scene or that you add to it. 
So with this interface, um, we have our layout. So if you go to the top right corner and click that layout bit, what you'll be able to do is there's a couple of preset ones. So there should be one called default, one called tall and wide, one called four split. And there should be a couple of other ones. So I've done some other ones. So when I do a presentation about 2D tools and things like that, I've made my own 2D interface that makes it a little attractive on an 800 by 600 projector, which happens quite a lot. Um, so for example, I like this presentation view, which I do sometimes. Um, most of you have probably got this, so I, I can just give this whole two days in this presentation if it makes it easier for you guys. But yeah, you can basically switch the layout to a different setting or save it in a particular way that you want. So um, if you're like me and you first open a 3D modeling program and get really, really scared by all the different things, so the first time I opened Maya, I was like, oh God, what's all this stuff? All this, like, a hundred buttons, there's different shells, there's things popping in and out of all the place. Um, so I'm basically going to go through all of these different scenes and all these different windows because without knowing what these do, uh, the next two days might be a bit difficult. So the most obvious one is the scene view in the middle. So the scene view, like The Sims, is basically your flyover and your viewpoint. It's like your fake bird's eye viewpoint of your game. So basically when you create your game, position trees or buildings or uh, characters and spawn points and things like that, this is basically going to be your representation, your flyover of that. So you can basically use mouse scroll to zoom in and zoom out of the central point. Um, holding Alt uh, allows you to click and basically you get an eye and you can rotate around it. And basically this is your whole scene. It goes on for very, very fast. So if I keep zooming out, eventually it'll, it'll just keep going on and on and on. And, uh, I'm not sure how far it is before it begins to say no more, but basically you can build up your whole scene position or your items here. So the scene view is probably where you'll be looking like 80 to 90% of the time that you're working in Unity, other than when you do the scripting side of things. Question. Hello. Uh, how do I change it to the black background? I think you need a pro version. You need a pro version? Yeah. <laughs> there is. Okay. So. <laughs> One thing you can do, so when I was like, uh, uh, years and years ago when I was a very poor student, I couldn't afford Unity Pro. Um, if you go into Unity at the top and then Preferences, or I think it's Help Preferences if you're on Windows, or Edit Preferences, uh, you can go to Colors, and basically you can tweak all of like okay. things. So I tried to tweak it, but I didn't, eventually get, I didn't eventually get to like something that looked exactly like it. I was trying to cheat the system a little bit. But doing that doesn't unlock all the cool stuff that Pro gets. Sorry. <laughs> but all the stuff that I'm going to be doing, uh, you don't need Pro, so that's cool. Um, it just gives you lots of extra bells and whistles and extra deep stuff. So we have our scene view. So the next window I'm going to talk about is the hierarchy. So the hierarchy is pretty much a drop-down list, almost like a, um, a roll call of all the items in your scene view. So for example, like that list is a roll call of all the people that are here. Um, that's what the hierarchy is. So currently we've, uh, yeah, we've got quite a busy scene. We have a camera and basically nothing else. Um, and if we had, for example, 20 buildings, um, a picture of the Mona Lisa, a cat and a dog and things like that, I'm just listing things off the top of my head, um, you'd have all these things stacked along the side and they'd all be there. So you can basically keep a check of what's in your scene and what's being used and what's basically in your view. So that's the hierarchy there. Um, the next thing is the project window down the bottom. So the project window is kind of like your bank. It's where you store all of your, not where you store your money. I mean, if you could print money, everyone would be using it, right? Um, it's basically where you store all the things you're going to be using in your game. So all your audio, 3D models, scripts, things like that. All the bits and pieces which you're then going to take. For, or It's kind of like the library in Flash where you save all of your images and things like that. You basically then bring them into your scene and bring them into your hierarchy to basically use them. So that's where we're going to be importing like some audio, some textures, some models of toast and some fruit and things like that. Um, as you hadn't guessed the name, fruit splat, into your project folder. So yeah, it's kind of like your bank of storing things. So the next one is the inspector. Um, so arguably, other than the scene view, this is probably the most important one in the entire in entirety of Unity. It shows basically a load of numbers and a load of visual representations of your objects that you've selected. So every new scene of Unity has a main camera. So if you select the main camera, what you'll notice is that the inspector changes to show what that particular object has. 
So in the hierarchy, if we select the camera, it's basically going to highlight which particular object that scene that we've selected. And what you can see here is a whole load of stats about the camera. So one thing is the transform. So the transform is exactly the whereabouts of this object in the scene. So its position, its rotation, its scale, those are all in x, y, z coordinates. And then underneath the transform, we also have the camera properties, which uh, the camera component, which is under here. So for example, our camera has a light blue background. It has a culling mask. Is it perspective or is it orthographic? So does it have a cone-like view or is it like a uniform view that a 2D game would have? Um, it, how far it clips, uh, it, all sorts of other bits and pieces, HDR, occlusion culling, you, it's a camera, you get it. And basically the camera is where the player is going to be viewing from. So a game like Bad Piggies, the camera is viewed from the side and they have the camera locked to either like where the, the, the pig and its cart is and things like that and it basically moves along with it. The camera is, the reason why they include it in new every scene is to stop people building their entire game and not including camera and then moaning that it's black when they port it to a mobile device or whatever it may be. So if we click on this window at the top here, game, it's next to the little Pac-Man, you'll see a completely blank and blue screen. Don't worry, that's fine, it's not blue screen of death. Um, I could have put something in there with like, which pops up a blue screen of death and we've got a certain point, but I won't make that joke again. Maybe. There's no promises there. So the game is kind of like a preview of what your player is going to see. So in a first-person shooting game, um, we'd have your scene view and you'd have all your roads and all your terrain plotted out and things like that. You'd probably have your camera where you want it to be positioned. So for example here, in, and maybe we have a gun floating in front of the camera, so what the player is going to be using to shoot enemies and things like that. And the game view is basically what the player is then seeing. So for example, the player is not seeing from a bird's eye perspective. It's not seeing from the top down, seeing all the trees and roads and things like that. Instead, what they're seeing is um, health bar, maybe a map in the corner, may then all the 3D geometry from the camera, um, and then perhaps a gun in the corner. So yeah, the game view and the pre game preview are two different things. Um, I used to be a teacher at university, and people struggled with that for quite a while. They would try and drag and drop items in the game view and understand why it wasn't working and things like that. I have actually asked the core devs to change it from game to preview or game preview because that makes more sense. Um, because technically it's not a game until you've built it to your particular platform. But uh, I don't know. They're developers. <laughs> cool. So let's do some stuff. So we have a camera here which is very boring, very standard. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go game object to the top. We're going to go down to create other and we've got a whole load of preset objects. So these preset objects are basically built up sets of components that create a particular thing. So for example, if we were going to make a terrain or a tree, it would basically create a tree. It would create up an element of a tree, all the components needed to render that tree, the collider for the tree, so on and so forth. If we wanted to make cloth, it would have cloth. How bendy is the cloth physics, so on and so forth. And what we're going to do is we're going to do what every developer does and make a cube. Game object, create other, and cube. So doing that, what you'll notice is a hierarchy now has another item added to it. So whereas we have the camera before, um, positioned at 0, 1, minus 10, we now have a cube as well. But they're very, very different. And what you can see is with the camera, it has a transform, it has a location within your scene, and it has all the camera components and things like that. But with the cube, we've, we've got something quite a bit different. So we have the position in the game view. Uh, we also have the mesh filter. Uh, we have a box collider, a mesh renderer, and the color of the cube. So it's, these are other sort of components in play. And these are all things that you need to render a 3D object. So you need, well, actually you don't need the box collider specifically, but I'll talk about it in a bit. So you need a mesh renderer. That's the message to the camera. It says, when this is in view of the camera, take this mesh, send it to the renderer, do your business and draw it on the screen. And then when it moves the next frame, it's like a giant extra sketch is then going to send another message to the renderer to say, OK, it's slightly moved. The mesh is now in a slightly different position. It's slightly changed. It's moved into this particular point. The enemy has moved his arm, so on and so forth. It's then going to send that message again. So the mesh renderer is basically how the object looks, or how, how, the, how, the, object, how the shape of the object is. Now, the box collider is how we can use it to interact with things. So the box collider, what you can see, is this green line. So if I turn off the mesh renderer, it's the green line. It's basically the bounding area that we use to collide with other objects. 
So for example, if we were to do a simple crate box game where we just drop crates and things like that, we would probably use a box collider because it's the most accurate to the object. However, what we can do is if we go to the components section at the top, we can add other components. So whilst these components here are all like the renderer and the collider and they're all preset things, you can add more to it. So if I wanted to perhaps make this cube, so we say, okay, we don't want a box collider. We're going to click the little cog and then go to remove component. That box doesn't have, a, doesn't have a collider. The player can now walk through it, can pass through it. You could use it to render maybe a waterfall texture coming down, so on and so forth. And we could say, okay, with the cube selected, go to component, and we have a load of other things we could apply to it. So for example, we could apply a halo around it. We could apply a projector onto it. We can make the box interactive piece of cloth. We could set it to be an audio point, which is going to emit audio from the game view. We can make it um, navigate across the map like a nav mesh, uh, that's other stuff. Um, we could put a skybox onto it. We can make it flare, so if we want to do like a J.J. Abrams Star Trek style thing, we could add a load of flares to the box and things like that. Basically, what we're doing is we're taking these preset components and just adding them to our object, so basically sculpting it how we want. So, for example, if I wanted to be very uh, adventurous, I could say this box now has a camera attached onto the box. So we now have two types of cameras, one being sitting elsewhere, one attached to the box, which doesn't actually make a lot of sense, so I'm going to undo that. But yeah, basically we have our cube, and we also have a box collider attached to it. So with this cube, what we're going to do is we're going to rename it. We're going to call this floor. And we're going to reposition it. So you might be able to guess what we're going to be using this for um, just by its name. Sorry, I, I have a lot of terrible jokes. I'm British, OK? Well, I've been living in Britain, but yeah. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to position this to a place where it would make sense for it to be a floor. So it's going to be slightly beneath the origin point of 0, 0, 0. Um, but slightly wider and flatter, and we're going to recolor it and things like that. So currently its position is 0, 1, and minus 10. So there's a couple of ways that we can reposition it. We could go into here, and we can basically edit these values and say instead of 1, it's going to be 2, so it's going to go up in the y-axis. Um, yep, and basically what I want to do is I want to set them, all these values to be 0, 0, 0. We will notice that the object's changed. Now if I zoom in and out, it's still going to the central core point. But a neat little trick, and I, I know a guy who's basically been using Unity for like four years, and he shipped tons and tons of games. He, when I showed this to him the other week, it blew his mind that this even existed in the engine. But basically, when you select an object and you hit F, it would focus into that object wherever it is in the game view. You don't have to get the grab handle and then move around and so on and so forth. And he's been working on like city builder games. So he'd have to like zoom into like this one tree on the other side of the map. And I was like, yeah, dude, if you just select and hit F, it auto focuses. And he was like, I want to kiss you. Like, this is like, this would have saved my life so many times. Um, so yeah, so we have our floor. And it doesn't look like a floor. It's very box-like. So what you can do is we can edit these values along the right-hand side here. So we can say, oh, I want it to have a, perhaps a rotation around the y-axis of 45 or 0 and things like that. Basically edit those. Or we want to change the scale of x to be a lot wider. Or if you're like me and inputting numbers, you know, it may not seem interesting until you sort of input them and hit enter. If you want to have be a bit more dynamic with creating your objects and scaling them, you can use these tools at the top. So we've got the move tool, which is fairly self-explanatory, and it gives you a gizmo. So you can then grab your object and move it around in your scene view. Uh, you can also grab a particular handle. So if you only move something in the y-axis, you can then grab it and position it like so. Uh, we also have the rotate tool. So the rotate tool allows you to then rotate it however way you want. Um, so if you want to position something not so precise. And what you'll notice is that the component of the transform basically edit changes as we ed move it as well. We don't have to move it and then like, click commit or apply or whatever. It basically does it automatically. Now that doesn't look like a very good floor, um, so I'm going to go back and make sure it's got a rotation 0, 0, 0. One thing I do want you to do is use the scale tool and basically pull out the handles and make the floor a bit floor-like. So a bit like that, so it's a bit you know, wider, and then thin it a little bit so it's not as fat. So we've got a sort of floor now. Well, hey, we're making video games. 
So uh, I gave a similar thing like this, what we're making, to uh, a bunch of like 13 year olds, I guess. And one of them at the end, bless him, he was like, I'm going to go make Call of Duty tomorrow. And it was so sweet. And I did send him an email saying, hey, have you made it yet? He goes, no, no, I am making a shooter though. And I've got a gun firing a thing, but no Call of Duty, no online multiplayer, dogs running around doing commando stuff and things like that. But I'm going to help him as best as I can. So now we have a floor, all I want you to do is position it a little bit lower. So perhaps maybe instead of using the move tool to move that down, we're just going to set its uh, Y value to be minus three. So what you'll notice is that with the grid, it kind of shows where the z zero is in um, X and Z uh, perspective axis. Uh, we can position it just beneath that, like so. We have a floor. Video games, awesome. It's not very interesting, is it? Not yet, it's just the floor at the moment. Cool, so what we're going to do now is we're going to set up uh, another object. So we're going to go game object, create other, and cube. So game object, create other, cube. Now there is a lot of other stuff here. There's spheres, there's capsules, <coughs> there's a plane, there's a quad. But we don't really want to do that. We want to spawn hundreds and hundreds of cubes and have them bouncing around and <coughs> having them as different colors and stuff, which is fun. I remember you were like, wow, this is cool. So yeah, it's an indication of what's to come. So what we're going to do is with this other cube, this is going to be our, um, this is going to be the thing we're going to duplicate. So the first thing that the majority of people do in uh, a game engine or something that can create objects is create lots of these objects. So they get one master copy and then just create hundreds and thousands of them to see if they can, I guess. So we're going to do a very simple thing where we're going to have an empty spawn point it's going to be an empty location, which we're just going to use as an X and Y and Z uh, coordinates. And every time we hit space bar or a different key, it's basically going to create uh, a master prefab that we've saved into our project. And it's going to create to that point and drop it. And we're going to alternate its colors, maybe randomly rotate it, make it bouncy. So basically, we have sort of input, things happening with the input, and basically doing the, uh, the basic thing, the thing that gets people hooked um, with making games and stuff. So this cube, um, let, yeah, let's just call it cube, actually. Let's be boring. So what you'll notice is that if we use that game object <coughs> create other cube, we now have a couple of things that we want to use. A box collider. We want our cube to be affected by other objects. We want it to fall, to land on the platform, and affect its collider. If we didn't have the box collider, it would pass right through. It's got no, it's got no form of uh, collision data, nothing to say, this will now collide with a particular object. Now, if I took my object and went component physics sphere collider instead and replaced it. What you'll notice is that it's now slightly different. So if I turn off the, um, if I increase the scale of this, what you'll notice is it's now, when I drop this object onto the platform, it's not going to act like a box. It's now going to act like a sphere and it's going to roll away and so on and so forth. And that looked very strange. So what you can do is go back to using a box because that's more accurate to the shape. Now we're going to be using uh, various fruit later on, and I'll talk about fruit colliders and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I like food. You'll probably be able to tell this very quickly. Uh, not yet. Cool. So we've got our cube. Now, um, everything looks very grey and very bleak. Um, I'm not talking about the weather, but yeah. Is it, is it touched on? Yeah. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to add some colour and we're going to actually change some bits and pieces. To do this, we're going to create some materials in our project folder and basic in our project window and then add them onto our shape. But I need to take a slight detour for us first. So if I go to my desktop and I made that project called Fruit Splat, what you'll notice is that if you open this up and you'll see the same thing on your, uh, like, is it win it's like Explorer? I haven't used the Windows laptop in a while, sorry. <laughs> Fruit Splat. We you'll notice that you have four subfolders. We have Assets, Library, Project Settings, and Temp. So you don't want to muck around with Temp. That's kind of like all the background stuff going on, deleting stuff in there can be very uh, dodgy. Um, basically, Temp will disappear when we're not have that project in use. So if, for example, I go to a completely different project, this is a different Fruit Splat that isn't even open. There's no Temp. So Temp is kind of like allocating all the temporary resources and stuff like that. You don't need to worry about that. The project settings. So the project settings is all the background stuff of the engine. So this is like, for example, the level of quality. What are the physics super bouncy or not? 
stuff like that. You don't need to muck around with that. And when we edit things in Unity, it'll auto update these files. Uh, library, I wouldn't recommend deleting any of this because Unity might break. So kind of don't worry about that too much. The next one is assets. And you notice there's nothing in there because there's nothing in our game. Now this assets folder, um, uh, which then disappeared. Okay, that's cool. This assets folder has a direct link to our project here. Basically, they are the one and same. So if I go into this assets folder and I make a new folder and call it materials, and let's make another one and call it um, scenes, and let's make another one and call it scripts. So I've just made three folders. Um, you'll notice that I'm a bit of a stickler for naming things correctly. So when I was a teacher, trying to mark um, people's websites or them asking me why on my website not online, it's untitled.html, untitled.css, untitled-2.css. Um, their main input control script was untitled.cs. Uh, yeah, I didn't like that at all. And having 120 untitled files wasn't the most fun thing in the world to mark. Um, so what we have here is we have materials, scenes and scripts. We just made a couple of projects folders and these can hold content for our game. Now when we go back into Unity, what you notice is it's automatically created those folders in our project and we should have these three files here. And as we create things, so if I then go in Unity and I say actually I'm going to go to uh, right click create a folder in Unity, so let's call this folder 3D models. So we now added 3D models to this folders. If I have a look into my folder strip, oh yeah, cool, it's actually made it. So anything that we do in these folders here on this desktop here, basically auto imports into Unity. So if we are an artist and we, I know there's like one or two of you put your hands up for artists. So if you're working on, for example, like a texture that's gonna go in your game for a tree, um, what you do is you just save the PSD into like a textures folder. Actually, yeah, let's make textures. A textures folder. You just save the PSD into there. Just go back into Unity. It'll auto import it. It automatically updates it, and then just apply it to your thing. So yeah, basically the workflow of bringing things into Unity is save them into this folder. You don't have to import, do some trickery, some magic thing. Unity talks to a lot of items and a lot of files and a lot of things um, in the import process, and you don't have to worry about it too much. Cool. Okay, I've got some slides. So yeah, so a couple of people still find this very strange. So if you have asset importing um, and bringing things into Unity, because obviously we don't want to make a game that's completely all cubes unless you're making, remaking Minecraft. Um, so we've got Maya, Photoshop and Audacity. So they're just, I mean, 3D modeling program, uh, image editing and an open source audio. Has anyone used Audacity here before? Kind of my role. Pardon? Oh really? It's, so many people use it. It's amazing. It's super cool. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't know otherwise. You would never admit it. But it's really That's super cool. Yeah, it's. I mean, for, I'm not a massive audio guy, so being able to chuck something in, crop it, tweak it, and then export it out the other side without having to set up loads of other bits and pieces is quite amazing. So you just have all your assets. You have your 3D models. You have all your bits and pieces. You then just literally just save them into that project folder, and they're just imported into Unity straight away. There is some form of error with your script or your code or things like that. Unity will tell you. It tells you the majority of errors, um, probably about ninety percent of the errors, and it even tells you where to go online to basically solve it, which is quite cool. And then you just put it anywhere. So that's sort of this whole author wants to play anyway. You just bring all your assets in into Unity. When you build it to different platforms, it will compile it to that particular thing, and it handles all that bits and pieces for you. So there's no mucking around with making. An iOS version, then an Android version, then a web version. Da, 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 da. You can just build it all in Unity and then write slightly different scripts for input controls and then just stick it out the other if side. If I don't use an asset, will it be compiled into the project anyway? Pardon? If I just have an asset in the asset folder but doesn't use it, will it be compiled in the program? Yes, yes it okay. will. Um, if you, uh, however, if you do like a 2D game, they're, make, they're working on a system called a sprite packer where basically the sprite packer auto atlases all your 2D sprites and basically works out what you're using, what you're not using and then compiles it all into a thing, yeah. Um, but yeah, if you do have a asset, so if I, for example, uploaded 
a three hour audio book into my project and then built a really simple game and pushed it out, it would include that three hour in the build size. It won't include it in like anything else, it's just in the project file size, so it's not being rendered and stuff like that, it's just sitting in dormant memory. So yeah, try not to put stuff that you're not going to, or just delete it out of the folder, like that seems to be an easier way to do it. Uh, both. Yeah, so uh, some of you are using free versions, some of you are using pro version. Uh, is anyone using pro version other than me? Has anyone got like a dark interface like uh, this? Okay, cool. Yeah, it's, it's the same either way. It also imports stuff in, so that's quite cool. Um, cool, so let's change some colors. So we have this bottom panel here. Uh, okay, this is a personal thing. I don't like this bottom panel here. I think it's a really strange file format and weird structure. So you can stick to it, but I'm going to change it to something which is a bit easier to navigate. So if you click to this, this three lines, this little drop down arrow here, we've got one column layout and two column layout. If you switch to one column layout, it's a bit more of a file structure. So for example, when we open up the materials file, you'll have all your bits and pieces in there. Um, I'm, I personally don't like it this other way where you basically click that and go into there because then you never be able to see all your assets in one place. You always have to go into another partition to then view it and then pop out and then view it in a different thing. I always prefer it the one column way, the original way, because the original is always better. Cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a new material. So as well as importing assets in like textures and audio and things like that, in Unity we can create items we're going to save into our project. So if you go to that create drop down arrow, we've got folders, which is fairly obvious, different types of scripting, um, prefabs, which we'll talk about in a bit, materials, controllers, physical materials, basically all the stuff that Unity, Unity's own made uh, items you can save in the project. So let's create a material. So go to create material. Um, I'm going to call this material uh, cube mat, and I'm going to drag and drop it into the materials section, materials folder. So what you'll notice is that materials folder now opens and closes, and basically as we add more materials, we're going to have various fruits and toast textures and things like that. Uh, basically what you'll be able to do is you'll have all your materials that you're going to use in this little drop down area. So I'll show you an example of why I don't like the other way, is because we have this cube mat here, so then we go back to the assets, but what if I want to move the cube mat into the scenes view, I then have to go into here and then it uh, I, yeah, I don't like it. It's, you don't have all your stuff. I like to be able to see all my stuff in one place. Whereas this way, it pops in and out. Awesome. So yeah, it depends which way you want to do it, but this is the better way. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> but I, I know lots of developers who use the other way because that's just the way that they've always known, um, even though the other way was first. I don't know. It, it doesn't really matter. You can still make your game either way. So what you'll notice is if we click our cube, um, it has a default material onto it. That's to stop it from just not rendering and people getting really scared that they've just made a cube and it's not got a material. So w with our renderer, it's basically saying what our shape, uh, what our form of our shape is. And what I mean by material is what shader it is. Is it shiny like a car? Is it semi-transparent like water? Is it glossy? Does it illuminate itself? Like in Left 4 Dead, does it have like a green outline around, uh, you know, around the outside of the mesh and things like that? It's basically all the things to say, how does it look? Like what color it is and things like that. Now we don't want that default defuse. That's basically added to any object that you bring into Unity that doesn't have material. Um, so kind of we're going to say goodbye to that. We don't want to see you. We're going to use the cube map. So there's a couple ways we can do that. One way is to select the material and just drag and drop it onto the cube. So I'm just going to drag the cube mat onto the cube. Select the cube, and what you'll notice is that no more default defuse. It's instantly popped out and changed for cube mat. So if I made a different material, I'd just be able to drag and drop it onto the cube, and it'll go through, take out that first material, and then swap in the second material. So it says, goodbye default defuse, go away. We don't really want you. We want to do our own stuff. So we have our cube mat. So does anyone know what a shader is, or can explain what a shader is? The short answer is, it's how it looks. <laughs> okay, so you are, you are right with the, with the shadows and things like that. But with these shaders, basically you're applying to the object the shadows and then overlaid on top of that. So for example, you could have a shader which then treats the shadows as, rather than a hard edge, like a pixeled edge around the outside, kind of like Minecraft or something like that. Um, but in this case, with these shaders, they're basically the messages to the render of how this particular um, mesh is formed. 
uh, how it looks, I mean. So we have the mesh render to say how it's rendering that mesh and what the shape is, whereas the shader is kind of like, um, is it shiny and stuff like that. Uh, so yes, you are right. <laughs> That's cool. So what we can do here is we can basically change it. So diffuse is fairly, fairly standard. Um, it's kind of like this murky grayish, it's, it's, it's fairly normal. But what you can do is we can go to diffuse and we can say instead of being a diffuse, we want you to be specular. Now what specular allows you to do is it basically allows you to add an element of shininess. So we can, for example, say it's slightly yellow, um, the main texture is red, and then we can basically tweak it. So we can basically say the main texture is red, but there's a shiny yellow element of specular yellowness onto it as you move around and how it's being affected. And there's a whole list of drop-down different shaders you can play with. You can program your own shaders and write your own shaders and bring them in, which is what a lot of people do. There's a guy who's trying to make an open source list of Nintendo shaders. So he's trying to write shaders that Nintendo writes and then just release for free. He's not going to get far. Um, they will probably find him. But yeah, so basically we can go into here. We have, for example, shaders for nature. We have a shader for tree creator bark. A shader for bark, which is a very specific thing. Which basically, if I mean, if I change it to tree creator bark, it allows me to apply, for example, the base texture, the normal map of that texture. So if it's bumped and things like that, scale, how squashed it is, and things like that. It's not doing much to my cube because it's not a piece of bark. Um, we have, for example, we can set transparency to a shader. We have those transparent types, so we can make our cube slightly, you know, lighter red. These are all sort of out-of-the-box shaders that you can basically play around with and use, but a lot of people have written their own shaders and extend it a bit further um, than that. So like Left 4 Dead shaders and things like that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick to specular so I have a nice shiny box. You guys can do whatever you want. You can change to a different color. You can program your shader if you're hardcore, like this chap. You've probably written like seven other shaders right now, right? No. <laughs> you can make it reflective. Yeah, basically it's kind of a chance to play around with it and basically see what each of these uh, different shaders do. Um, so when I first started using Unity uh, years ago, I went through and tried out every single one and made a list of what every single one did. I've forgotten half of them now because, you know, some things like GUI textured or I don't use anymore and stuff like that. But yeah, it's cool. So we have our box like so. Now what we're going to do is we're going to switch to the game view. Now that we actually have stuff to see in, it doesn't look that interesting. It's, or it's like a Thomas Was Alone clone. Do you guys know Thomas Was Alone? It's like a 2D side scroll platformer and the entire game is just a bunch of cubes, but they all have feelings and personalities and voiceovers and emotions and things like that, like one cube feels depressed and stuff, and you feel very sorry for them. Um, no, we're not making a Thomas Was Alone clone. What we're going to be doing instead is going to be editing this. So what we have here in our scene view is they give a kind of artificial light so, so toggling this basically says, this is what the end game view light is going to be like. You basically can't see anything. Turning that off basically gives it an artificial light so you can actually see what the heck you're doing in your game and construct it up. So for example, you might have a developer, programmer, and an artist. The artist is still working on the lighting, how the light source works in the game, what light maps are, and things like that. But the developer wants to get cracking and start putting things in and positioning things. So he can just turn on the artificial light, go in, position bits and pieces. Then when the artist comes around to doing that lighting pass in the development of the project, he can basically turn that off and then position the light. However, the game view, so whilst we have the artificial light on, the game view doesn't show that artificial light. In the end, this is what the player is going to be seeing. So what we have to do is we have to add a light in. And people like this bit because it's fun. So if we go to game object at the top, create other, we've got four types of light. We have directional light, point light, spotlight, and area light. Some of these are very self-explanatory, and some of them are not so self-explanatory. So we're going to go through all of them. So we're going to create a directional light. It gets added into a hierarchy stack. And can anyone take a guess what a directional light does, or what it is, or what it simulates? The sun. Yes. And no. Yes. Yeah. So the directional light is the cheapest in memory of all the lights. Basically, it just says, create a light source from this particular angle and affect everything. So for example, the light is default point down at this particular <coughs> angle. So what you'll notice is that the side of this cube here um, 
is going to be lighter than the other sides because the light is obviously pointing down at that particular angle. However, if I take that light, so the position of the light doesn't actually, of the directional light, doesn't mean anything. I can position it this side, but that side is still being lit, which always confused me at first, but I, I've got over it. So what we can do is if we rotate it, we can basically say, actually, we want it to be, I don't know, pointing straight up. So now what you'll notice is that the bottom side of the cube is affecting the light. So the light is very useful for outdoor scenes. So yeah, you are right. If you had, for example, like a uh, top-down game, you had troops and things, you just want to stick a directional light up in the sky, shining it down. Maybe you then want to like make it go darker and things like that over time. So it's, it's very cheap because all it's doing is it's going through all of the things it's affecting. Um, it's going through all of the things it's affecting. It's going and recoloring all, recoloring all like the vertices and all the triangles and things like that. It's not actually doing any extra sort of bits and pieces to work out how it's affecting those. It's just recoloring them. So the directional light's the cheapest. A lot of people use it for mobile stuff. So what you'll notice is that with the light component, we've got some more things to play around with. And one thing that Unity has is it's got a lot of some fun stuff that you can basically tick and tweak and play around with and access via code. So we can change the type of light. We can also change the color. So we can basically say, emit a light, a dark blue thing onto all things. Now, what happens is our cube mat is still going to be red with this sort of a yellow tinge. It recolors it that way, but then it goes, the light then goes through, and it even you can tell by the floor, and then goes through and does this blue overlay on top of that red. So now it kind of looks brown, I guess. Yeah. So we can change the color. I'm going to change it back to white. We can change intensity, so we could have a super bright light. So it's like that. Or we could basically dim it. Um, a lot of this stuff you can sort of play around with how you want. We can set it to be zero, but I'm going to leave it at 0 0.6. We, have, we can have a cookie, so we can cut out a particular light and imprint texture onto objects. We can have a type of shadow, so let's have a hard shadow. And what you'll notice is that if I rotate it, the cube, basically the light is now emitting a hard shadow, and then when it reaches this point, it's then going to go down and emit it onto the cube there, which is quite cool. Um, we also have a soft shadow as well. So basically the hard shadow, it hard cut out the shadow around the edge, where the soft shadow is more of like a, uh, it's got an alpha to it basically, and basically you can set how soft it is and things like that, so that's quite cool. Uh, I'm just going to leave it hard shadow. You can tell it to draw a halo and things like that, which should leave a white outline, but it doesn't. Hey, yeah, we've got lots of other stuff. So the directional light is that one, it's fairly simple. Uh, the point light is sort of like the next one up in terms of... Um, uh, how expensive it is to use. So the point light tends to be one that everyone everyone likes using that I meet. So what it is, is it's more of a radial thing. It's more like a light bulb. So for example, it's how a true light works. So if I went out and turned out all the lights in here and I just left one of those candles lit, basically it would be affected like a point light. It's basically emitting a light source from that particular area. And there's going to be some fall off as it's traveling through the room as it's affecting different things. So obviously the light candle over there by itself, is a, it's going to get to a stage where it's not emitting any more light when it gets to a certain point. It's not affecting light onto particular objects. And what you can notice here is that as we swap it in, so if we go from directional light has all these particular settings, as we change to point light, we've got some new things to play around with. So for example, we have the range, so we can basically scale it. So if we were doing a little candle, we can set the range to be very small. And what you'll notice is that when anything within this particular range so as we then, you know, move it down towards the floor, basically it's anything within that range is then affected by that light. So this is like, you know, to simulate a candle. Whereas if you want to do something like um, the sun, we then set it to be 50 and it's very big. So it's affecting a lot of things. So basically tweaking the range is uh, it, how far it reaches. I'm going to set this to just be 20. Uh, uh, yeah, 20 is quite cool. And we can set the intensity and things like that. So I'm going to leave it at 20. So this is the next one up, because whereas with the directional light, basically it just comes at an angle and it just tells all the different vertices and things like that to basically retint or recolor based on like those settings. With the point light, it does an extra layer of calculation. So what it does is it then, uh, the camera draws, for example, the floor, draws the cube, then it goes to all the lights, and then it draws how the light affects that floor how the light affects that cube. And I know this is, I mean, this is the most simplest scene you can make in Unity other than just the floor that we had earlier on. But if you have lots and lots of objects and lots and lots of point lights, every frame it's got to draw all these objects, then draw how one light affects all them, and then how another light affects all them. 
And slowly these, things, these calculations start to mount up. Then the next frame has then got to redraw all of them. It's like a massive Etch-a-Sketch, and people are constantly adding to your Etch-a-Sketch as you're trying to draw it and animate it, which would take a lot of time. So, yeah, point light's kind of like that next stuff up. Next one is spotlight, which is fairly obvious what it does. So the spotlight just it emits a cone of light to a particular point. Um, so whereas this is very similar in a sense of how much ren uh, GPU the point light uses, Spotlight uses more CPU because it's got to calculate this particular cone that it's going to emit out at. Um, and basically you can uh, tell it how long it's going to be. Uh, you can basically increase the range and things like that. So is it going to be a broad spotlight or a thin spotlight? Um, again, when I was a teacher at school, as soon as I showed people spotlights, they just wanted to make clones of Slender. Have you guys played Slender? Like you walk around, there's like the thing in the white mask and it just scares them and dilates out of you and they're making a sequel. And why would they make a sequel? Because it's scary. Or amnesia and things like that. So what a lot of people do is they get a spotlight, attach it to a camera, and then they program the camera to walk around with a spotlight looking around and oh, we're making a horror game and stuff like that. Which is a lot of what a lot of people do, which is quite cool. Um, I did it, so that's all right. Um, yeah, so the spotlight is sort of the next one. Um, the area light, it basically, I'm not going to talk about this too much because you have to bake it and I'll go into light mapping and that's sort of a whole area. It's basically kind of like, you know American football, they have those big grid lights that basically are above the pitches and they basically shine like almost like a square block out. It's kind of like that. So basically you specify in this particular area, emit this light from this particular block as opposed to a single point. It's more like a floodlight. If you, if you know your camera stuff, it's more like a floodlight basically flooding out the scene. Um, but you can you have to bake that into a particular scene. I'm not going to sort of do that um, too much. So pick your light, whichever one you want. If you want to be sort of a bit moody and a bit dark, go with the spotlight and shine it and rotate in a particular point. I'm going to use the point light because I can actually see what's going on and the directional. It's more interesting than directional light, basically. Uh, so who went with the point light in the end? Or about directional light? about spotlight any light people are asleep <coughs> yeah okay cool if you said yeah that means you're not asleep or you're just very good at talking in sleep yeah. awesome cool so let's get some other bits and pieces in here so now if we go back to our game view what you'll notice is that we now have light hooray so Whenever I work on a project or work on a game, like in a game jam and stuff like that, I always turn off the artificial light because it's always fake. It doesn't really tell you how your game's going to look in the end. And if you design your scene and your art style for the artificial light, you're not using it anyway in the end. So the first thing I do when I was set up a project is set up the folders, turn off the artificial light because uh, I, yeah, basically it just makes sense to uh, use what you're actually going to use. So yeah, make sure in your scene view you actually have the light emitting something from a particular point. If you go to the game view, what you'll notice is it's viewing it from that particular angle. Cool. However, this angle is a bit rubbish. We need to reposition it. So one thing that uh, a lot of people like with Unity is you can customize your windows and your layouts. You can basically redock your layouts however you want. So if you're an artist, you can dock it in a way that would suit your art workflow. So for example, you could have your projects window on the left. You could then have your import inspector in the middle and then you could have your scene on the right so you're going to bring in the textures apply them and then you know bring them into the scene if you're more of like a debug or optimization person you might have for example the light map and light mapping tool and things like that basically you can tweak it how you want now the scene view and the game view are both docked underneath the same window which isn't going to be useful for us if we're positioning the camera so all i'm going to do is i'm going to drag the game view tab out what you'll notice is it basically snaps to all these different locations. It says, where can it go? So I could have it there if I really wanted to. But instead, I'm going to dock it next to the scene view. So we have our, why can't I not make project on this? OK, cool. So we've got a game view on the right, and we've got a scene view on the left. Um, yeah, like so. So my screen's kind of squashed everything up because I'm presenting a projector, but you guys might. So we can actually see what our game's doing. So. Basically, we can move our object up and down, and we can actually see what it's going to look like in the game view. But in the scene view, you can view it from whatever angle you want. So what we can, what I want to do is, and this is another little trick, for these people use Unity before, is I want my camera to be viewing it from that particular angle. So we have our scene view here on the camera to then say, instead of rendering it from the side like that, but still in perspective, 
I want it to be rendered like that because that looks cool. I can see all the floor, I can see where the cube's going to be and stuff like that. So what some people could do is you could go to the game view, reposition the camera, so on and so forth. But here's a little trick that you can do is if you move, if you have your scene view like so, then click the main camera. So you have the main camera selected and you can see it in the inspect on the side. Then go to game object align with view. Basically what it's going to do is it's going to take the camera and stick it wherever your scene view is. Ta-da! So yeah, basically it auto snaps to there. There's no mucking around with, um, <coughs> you know, getting the gizmos and rotating things and stuff like that. So all I want you to do is to perhaps move your scene view camera like that. Select the camera and go to game object align with view. Oh, okay, that's probably a bit too close. Like so. So we now have basically what our game is going to look like. Awesome. Everyone okay with that? It's a neat little trick. I told that not to that one guy who was blown away by F for focus, but to another person. She was like, what? Like, that's just mad. Normally I'd have to go in and ha I'd have to move this little gizmo and move it so precisely and things like that. Uh, but no, yeah, game object to line review. Super cool. So we have our game. Now, I'm going to come on to the play mode now. So did you say lunch was at 12? Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. That's cool. So this is at the top here. So with Unity, you don't have to go do something like, you know Flash, you click like publish. Is it publish or build or something like that? Anyone here a Flash developer? It's quite telling. Publish. Pub yeah, publish, right? And then it basically then exports a like thing, like a Swift, and then it plays your game and stuff. Well, in Unity, what you can do is you can basically almost like publish within the editor and see what's happening and what things are doing. And that's with the top bit here. So normally to build to a particular platform, you'd have to go file, build settings, and then this is that big drop-down list of things. You basically pick what you want to build to. So if it's iOS, it would build a native iOS project. If it's for web player, it would build like a HTML page and like a Unity embedded thing. When we do Windows stuff, it's going to build a Visual Studio project with like a solution file, which would be able to go in and tweak some bits and pieces. But we don't need to build that every single time if we want to test stuff in the editor. All we do is we click the play button at the top. Nothing should happen. But what you can see now is our game is running. We can basically, we can write some code. Um, so for example, enemies will now spawn at a rate of every two seconds as opposed to 10 seconds. Click play. Go through our game view, play our game, shoot things, da 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 da. And what you can see in the game view is what you're doing, so all your inputs. In the scene view, at any point you can go, wait, stop, what was that bug? Select, for example, the cube here, and then zoom in on it and basically see, what, what was that? You know, what's it currently doing at that, this particular stage? So basically, you're, you can debug and see what's happening and pause at any time and almost freeze frame it and say, hang on, there's a slight Z fighting glitch over here, or there's a particular error over here, or why did that audio clip not play? And you can pause it, see what's in your game and things like that. So if you had a game where you spawned like bullets from a gun, the hierarchy would add those bullets in. So you can literally pause the game, select, for example, a bullet, and focus in exactly where it is and see what speed it's going in. And then you can use the stepper to basically move to the next frame, to, to move it, step along to the next frame. Like the matrix of slowing down the game and seeing what it's doing every frame, which is quite cool. You don't have to build and publish each time. So you're kind of like doing a mock build publish. That's what that temp <coughs> folder is for. It's doing all that sort of mini calculations. Can it also go back to previous frames? Uh, no. Sorry. I'm sure that someone, because you can write lots of scripts that extend the editor and make extra windows and things like that, I'm sure that you, someone has probably written something like that. There tends to be a thing with the community. I think, oh, no, this will be a pretty cool like, extension to do into the game. And then I say, oh, someone's already done it. Like, it's like the Simpsons rule. Any other... if. Any cartoon, any joke they make, Simpsons already done the joke before. Yeah, like it's, it's such a silly rule. But yeah, so you can't go back to previous frames. Although I know a guy who was working on a thing, but I think he already found someone who's already made it and stuff like that. So yeah, you can write your own custom windows that can help you and do unit tests and things. So yeah. Um, but no, you step forward through the game and stuff. So yeah, currently if we click play, Absolutely nothing happens, which is good. If something happened, I'd be a bit worried because we haven't scripted anything in to happen. So what we want to do is when we click play, our cube is to be affected by physics. 
to default all objects aren't affected by physics. This is to simply to stop uh, the artist who doesn't know Unity too well, brings in a hundred buildings, politicians do all, doesn't bother testing it, developer comes the next day, clicks play, all the buildings of physics and they all just suddenly fly up in the air. <laughs> you know, it's basically stop that. You basically have to opt for an object to have physics. So a couple of things that you'd need the object to have to have physics and affect other things is a box collider. I mean, our cube has a box collider and our floor has a box collider. And the next thing is a rigid body. So selecting the cube, go to component, and underneath here, we have two types of physics. We have physics 2D for 2D objects and physics, which is just for 3D objects. And you notice physics 3D objects is a bit more, has a bit more bits and pieces, but they're adding things to the 2D stuff and working on some other stuff. So we're going to go physics, rigid body, and what you'll notice is that now we've added that component to the cube, it's added it to its stack. So it's all its other information, so the position in the game world, its box collider, its mesh renderer, how it looks, what color it is. It's now added that component to that stack. So basically you can add up and build up your object. Now it has a rigid body. So the rigid body is basically a way of saying, this is now affected by 3D physics. Physics do your thing. So if I took my phone um, and dropped it on the floor, it's an iPhone, so some of you might be happy with that. Uh, iPhone 4 even, so I'd be happy with that because it's super slow on iOS 7. And it's about three hours battery life. So if I drop that on the floor, that's affected, that, that is a rigid body. It's being affected by physics. Whereas, for example, if I push this house over, I'm not able to because it's not affected by physics to an extent that my mass is greater than it. So yeah, basically, this box is now affected by physics. So then if we play our game or play our scene view, it then drops and lands on the platform. And if we then take our cube and then rotate it in a particular way, so for example, face down, it now has particular physics that it's going to fall. Now, that's very, very basic, right? It's not, nothing too expansive, nothing too groundbreaking yet, but we're going to do some cool stuff with this. So we have things such as mass. So if we had, for example, a large box and a character pushing that box, obviously you'd want to work out the mass of that box. So you don't want the player to go up to push it and it goes flying across the screen. You want it to go up to it and then basically tweak it. So for example, you may set the mass to be 50, for example, when it's affected by the things. We also have drag, so how much mass that drags. So for example, if we're flying an object through the air we, and we, it's going too fast with this force, we may want to add drag to it so it kind of like slows itself down as it <coughs> progresses through the scene. Uh, we have collision detection, <coughs> but a lot of these things we can set. Use gravity, so if we make a space game, we turn off all the gravity of all the physics and then as we push something, it would then float through the air. It's not affected by the angle going, uh, the physics going down. And we've got our scene and our very simple box falling like this. So let's make thousands of them because that's fun. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make a prefab. Um, and where is my prefab? Bit? Yeah, so a prefab, yeah, so here's a lemon. Um, so a prefab is basically a way of storing t some form of object with loads of components. So for example, this cube, we've already edited this cube. We've already said to this cube, have a rigid body, have this. Now if I wanted you guys, if I was wanted to be really, really cruel, which I'm not going to, I could say, right, I now want you to make a thousand cubes without copy and pasting that cube and adding up all the materials and things each time. M majority of you wouldn't bother doing it because you're a lot smarter than that, but maybe one or two of you will get to ten cubes and then say, hang on, yeah, this is this kind of <laughs> a little fishy. <laughs> He's getting to do extra stuff. So prefab is basically a way of saving an object for a later day. It's basically saving a master copy to then duplicate and use. So uh, again, I taught a similar lesson to this to a bunch of 13 year olds and I said, so like Mario is a good example of this. So for example, the coins in the first Mario Brothers game were all prefabs, were all master copies from this one object. It's a coin to say, when you pick it up it has a certain sound, it's a certain size, it bounces on the ground, it gives you a point. It's basically all this behavioral stuff which you then they just take one and they just duplicate it millions and millions of times. So this kid's like, wait, I've been picking up like the same coin millions and millions of times. That's really trippy. And I'm like, I guess, dude, or yeah, <laughs> whatever that response is. Uh, yeah, so basically with this lemon, for example, and we're, yeah, we're going to use lemons later on, you'd build up the lemon in a particular way. So you'd have your mesh for the lemon. You then have textures applied to the lemon. You'd have some form of material. So it all feeds into this lemon. And what you'd be able to have is you'd be able to have a lemon built up of, for example, its position, its rotation, its scale. It has a mesh collider. It has physics. It has a texture. It has all of these things. 
Then in your project folder, which is all your assets and all your things that you're going to use, you can then save that lemon as, as a prefab. You're going to save it for a rainy day. You can then delete it from your scene because you've already got like a saved little file basically say, this is a lemon with all its lemony properties. And then you can duplicate it hundreds of times. You can just say to that, you can say in code, instantiate lemon, and it will basically take that lemon and make a copy of it and copy and a copy and a copy and a copy. And not only do you do that by code, you can drag and drop it. So for example, if I ever use buildings, so like you have five buildings, I have all them prefabs and I just drag and drop them in there. I say, actually, I want this building, drag that into the scene, this one. I've just got five basically ink pots, which I'm just taking different inks from and stuff like that. So, okay, let's go back and do that. So we've got our cube. Uh, I don't want you to make thousands of them, like hand do that, that would take ages. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a prefab. So if we go into our project and go to create folder prefab, what we're gonna do now is we're going to go to create prefab. So you've made a folder called prefab and we've got a new object called new prefab. So like we have some materials, um, or our material called cubemat, we're gonna have a new thing called new prefab and I'm gonna call this cube master, or actually cube prefab. So I always like to add onto the end of objects that I say in my project what particular type it is. So is it a scene, is it an audio clip and things like that. That way it's quite useful for me when I'm going through. So if I look at something that says lemon, I'm not wondering is it an object, is it a texture, is it an audio clip of a lemon squashing and stuff like that. I'm really spoiling stuff that we're going to do later on. So yeah. So we've got our cube prefab and currently it's blank. With that cube prefab selected we have no information about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to select the cube, drag and drop it onto that cube prefab section and let go. And what you'll notice is that cube, we now have a little blue highlight and we've got all its content there. And then you can delete the one from the scene. So in our scene, all we've got is a directional light or whatever light you chose, a floor and main camera. And in our project, we've got a material and we have a cube prefab. And you can see a little preview of what that cube prefab has. We basically saved a little stored copy file of this, which we're now going to create lots and lots of using script and stuff, which is cool. Why did you create a new prefab instead of just dragging the object? Pardon? Why did you create a new empty prefab instead of just dragging the object? I two ways you can do it. Okay, so one way that you can create a prefab is just by going create prefab. It then gives you a blank prefab. But another thing that uh, you could do instead, um, yes, delete that, is basically say, I want a prefab of the floor. You can just drag and drop the floor in. It will create a prefab of that floor like that. So yes, it, you could do it either way. It's cool. It's like many different ways to cut the quiche. It's the same? I don't know. Pardon? I could call that folder... Lemon, if I really wanted to, yeah. But you know, you can you can name the folders whatever you want. You don't have to call them 3D models and lemon and things like that. Um, but I'm just calling it prefab simply because it's got a load of prefabs in. You can call them whatever you want and stuff. The only exception to that is if you write any editor extension scripts. So set your own, you write your own scripts to make your own windows or components and stuff. You need to have put in a folder called editor, so then it can send the message to Unity to create this as a custom window and stuff. That's like the, I think for some custom shaders you have to put in a folder called shader, maybe. I'm not too sure, but yeah, that, those are very sort of like specific things. So now that we have, oh god, what's happened here? Missing. Hello. If you, if you have the, the material for the prefab, what will happen to the prefab? If I delete the material? Yes. Uh, the prefab will go pink, because what Basically, pink. If you see anything bright pink in Unity, it's very bad. <laughs> Unless you're making like a kids' game, right? <laughs> Basically, because what's happened is we've said default diffuse. We didn't want you. We don't want you to be grey anymore. We want you to be interesting. We want you to be red with sort of shiny bits. Um, so that's cool. So that's fine. If I delete that source, so I say delete that. I don't want that material anymore. What will happen is the mesh render won't have anything to say what color it is or what tint it is. So, I, actually, I'm going to be very dangerous and do that to show you what, what bad stuff looks like. Oh, yeah, so now that I've got my prefab, I can drag and drop them in and just create hundreds of them. 
But for example, we've got our prefab there. If I go to this material and say delete, pink, yeah. Very, very bad if you see something like this. Because basically, what you'll notice on the mesh render, it's a missing material. Anytime that anything says missing in Unity, it's bad because it means you've deleted a script or some form of thing it was depending on earlier on. So now I've got to remake my material. You set me up. That's right, I'll just make a red cube. But one simple way to do get around that is to just reapply that material onto there. Why is my cube? I don't know. Why my floor's red? It's cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to that cube. We're going to delete it from the scene, and we're going to make a spawn point. So in every single game, there are things called empty spawn points. So this may be a location that bullets are created at the end of a gun, or a place that an enemy is positioned at within the scene world. And it basically says when the, this particular rule happens, so when the player walks into a room, or when Mario goes into this particular world, spawn coins at these all individual spawn points at these particular coordinates. So you could set those coordinates up by code, which is fine. You just basically randomly pick an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, a Z coordinate, so on and so forth. But if you want to be more precise, what you can do is you can use this little trick. So if you go to game object and go to, instead of creating a pre-made object for us, we're going to use create empty. So create empty, all it does is it gives you a game object and with just coordinates. So this is kind of like a little trick that I do. So a lot of people do spawn points by code so they can hard code it in. But I just set a load of empty game objects because they're not because they don't have a mesh render or any material or anything like that, they're not extra stuff on the GPU. There's very little extra stuff on the CPU because it doesn't have to calculate physics or anything. They're literally just X, Y, Z coordinates, like the smallest thing that you can possibly have in game object form Unity. So I use these for spawn points because you can have thousands, I've had thousands and thousands and thousands of empty game objects on like my awful iPhone 4 and no slowdown whatsoever because they're not getting messages sent to the renderer and I'm using all the spawn points for coins and enemies and things. I'm going to call this cube spawn point and I'm going to position it somewhere above the floor. So as long as it's above the floor I'm happy, it doesn't matter too much. So basically cube spawn point is now here. So this is going to be the location that we're going to be creating our object at, um, at this particular point. We're going to write some code to do that as well, which is cool. So we have our spawn points. So we've got all the makings for our cube spawner. We have our cube saved. It's got material. It's got physics. We have a floor for it to land on. And we have a spawn point to create it at. Next, we need to write some code. So this is a practice that I tend to use. Whenever I write any important script, so this will be an input manager, thing that handles audio, a thing that handles, for example, scoreboards. I always make an empty game object, and I always call that game object manager. And then I just attach all the scripts I'm going to use in the scene onto that manager. That way, if, for example, I'm in my scene, I've got 500 objects, I think, I need to access the audio. All I can do is just go to the manager, I know all the audio is there. That way, you're basically using this one game object, this one instance, to hold all of the scripts for the scene for all the important stuff. Obviously, scripts that are more behavior dependent for like an enemy or a coin, place those scripts in that, but I'll talk about that in a sec. So yeah, just make the manager and we're going to write some code. So if we go to the scripts folder and we're going to go to create C sharp scripts, new behavior scripts, and we're going to call this item spawner. So like so. So I've capitalized two words. We're going to create C sharp scripts called item spawner. So um, in Unity, there's a couple of scripts that you can use who use the scripting API. So it's JavaScript, C Sharp Script, and Boo. Who knows what Boo is or uses Boo? Okay, cool. So, yeah, so you could write all your scripts in Boo if you want, but I've only met like two groups of people who've used Boo. One made that like Tesla grad game that I said was going to be on all the consoles, which is quite cool. The other one's the guys who write Boo um, <laughs> API for Unity. Um, the majority, I'd, I'd say the 99% of developers I've met all use C Sharp, so it tends to be the one most people go for. Uh, yeah, uh, because JavaScript gets you into some, I find, using JavaScript in Unity gets you into some messy coding things that you sh really shouldn't do. So, for example, not declaring a variable type, and then Unity's got to think, 
Right, so we have var uh, dog. What, what dog? Is it an audio clip? Is it all these particular types? Basically, yeah, C sharp, it's kind of a bit more strict. It basically tells you to define is it an integer, is it a flow, is it, you know, a vector 3, and so on and so forth. But does, don't you have extensions for so declaring JavaScript? <laughs> yes, but you don't have to put those extensions. And what I find with when I talk to students is they don't bother setting a thing as an integer or a float, they just leave that bit out and then they're like oh I don't need to worry about it and then you kind of do because it gets you into some really bad when you go to C sharp and then you just write public dog it's going to be like well, what are you on about that's really confusing yeah so now that we have our script called item spawner we're going to write some code but first we need to child it to something because this is a pro in our project folder this is all stuff that's laying dormant it's kind of like all stuff in our bank that we're going to use later on in our hierarchies, all the stuff in our scene and any script that we write that's saved in our project will only come to play in the hierarchy if it's in the scene. So what we need to do is we need to say to the C-sharp script called item spawner, drag and drop onto the manager like we did with that material. So now when we select manager, we have a little script called item spawner. We have item spawner within our scene, ready to rock, ready to do different bits and pieces. My Americanisms are now coming out, saying ready to rock <laughs> in writing code. Yeah, very rocking. Um, cool. So now we can write some code that does some stuff. So what we want to do is we want to go to item spawner and either double click the script in your project or double click the script on the manager and it will open up in a particular scripting, uh, in a particular text editor. So what will probably happen is it will open mono develop. Has anyone got Mono Develop opening or Visual Studio or? Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you download Unity, it downloads a version of Mono Develop which is basically catered for Unity. So it basically gives you things like autocomplete and stuff like that. And you write, you start writing color, and then it will auto recommend. Oh, you do you mean color? And you just can tab through and so on and so forth. If you don't like that, you don't want to use Mono Develop. You want to use Visual Studio. Or you want to use. Uh, I don't know, Microsoft Paint or whatever it is, or Notepad. What you can do is if you go to Unity Preferences, or is it Edit Preferences? Is that where it is on Windows? Yes. Yeah. Um, under External <coughs> Tools, you can choose your external script editor. So, for example, Monitor Web will be the default, uh, which you can use that if you want. That's still cool. I'm using Sublime Text 2 because it's just a habit. <laughs> um, but you can point it to other things. I did actually see some program like what I'm showing you guys how to do all completely in Microsoft Paint using like RGB values and converting that into a C sharp file. It was amazing. But I would never recommend it for Yeah sure. Is there someone who is using express version of Visual Studio? Okay. In case you're talking with folks that are using express version, you need to have the express version for Windows phone. To build up the apps for over that. For Windows 8, you need to have the the Windows version of Express. But you also need to have the desktop version of the Express. The reason is that Unity over here is using the project side called the class library project. And those are not in the Express versions of the phone and Windows. They're not. So I've managed to build it using Express. Yeah. But do you have the intelligence for that? So the issue was, at, at least if somebody knows more about this, I'm more than happy to hear, but what we found out was that you have the desktop version of the Express tools, which has to have all the, yeah, that makes sense. the yeah, yeah. namespacing and everything working, so it have, you have all the snippets, you have all the, 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 the intelligence and that kind of stuff over there. So just to let you know, if someone is using the Express version, you actually need that one too. And that's the one which you need to hook up over here when you do that. Cool. No worries. It only would take like two weeks to figure it out. Or you can use Notepad <laughs> if you really want to, or text edit or whatever. Mic's up there? Yeah. Cool. So. <laughs> cool. Um, cool. So we've got our script open. So what Unity does is when you make a new script, to access the Unity's API and write some code and things like that. 
it pre-builds a couple of stuff for you. And this is kind of like a recurring theme. Unity handles a lot of background things. So for example, it handles a lot of the physics. It integrates a lot of things in there and you tap into those resources. It handles a ticker, it handles a time frame, things like that. Basically, these are things which Unity handles so you can actually build your game as opposed to building an engine from scratch. Um, yeah, but you can access these properties. So in here, we basically created our C-sharp file and it's written some code for us. So at the top, it's just saying using Unity Engine, using systems.collections. It just adds at the top to say we're using this particular API and this particular framework, using these particular collections. We can extend that further. So if we wanted to use, uh, use Facebook, for example, so for example, there's a Facebook SDK that you can bring in. You can, for example, access your friends list in Unity and make like a, a whack-a-mole game with your friends' profile pictures or post your score into Facebook and things like that. If you want to use their SDK, you import in their plugin and their package. And at the top that you want to use Facebook, you'd write something like using Facebook, I think it's dot SDK, or it's something along those lines. So basically, you extend this top bit more and more how you want to use it. Um, so if you want to use Game Center, you use right, using Game Center and things like that. But we don't need to use that too much to start. Do you know if we support a uh, portable class library in Unity? Do you know what that is? Portable class library, give me an example. Portable class library is the possibility to have the same binaries in Windows Phone and Windows 8, and even in Samurai, Samurai now, so... Yeah, you, you, you can use it uh, through a plugins folder. Uh, there's uh, in Unity, you can extend your own functionality, but it needs to be a plugin to Unity if you want to have your own. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so next we've got our class. So the class basically dons whatever our script was called. So we've got a script called item spawner. It should auto fill that class to be item spawner. If you've got something else, set it to be the same as that class. And this is a mono behavior. So inside here we write all of our code for that particular class. And if you wanted to write our own classes for other things that handle other bits and pieces, all we did have to do is we could add it onto the end and write public class. Um, tile or block or enemy or whatever it is. But for this, we're just going to use the monitor behavior. And inside here, we write all of our code, all of our variables, our methods, our pointers, our event handlers, all the stuff that we need to use in our game. So we have two functions to begin with, void start and void update. And they very kindly code comment in what each thing does. So void start and void update are part of functions pre-built into Unity, which um, execute at various points. So void start is useful at the begin, beginning of a scene. So uh, you're playing uh, Counter-Strike, for example. You come into the scene. What happens then in void start is it positions all the players, positions ammo, sets everyone's health back to 100%, sets score to zero. It basically does all the setup, all the building blocks of the scene. It basically positions all the bits and pieces. So like Minecraft, it would then generate your map for you inside start. It may stick it into a loading screen, but it does all the stuff at the beginning. That's only run once. It runs at the very beginning. So when uh, I talk to like students and companies and things like that about optimization, I say do as much as you can in start. Set up everything you can possibly do in start. Because it's only run once, you can then call it from later on. So that's what start does. It does lots of beginning scene stuff. Um, update is a constantly recurring function. Every frame, it goes through and it runs all the code for update goes back to the top and runs all the code. So whereas in Flash, you'd have to write your own ticker to basically say when it calls all these things that are going to recalculate each time. Void, writing void update basically calls every single frame. So void update would be useful, for example, getting the input. So whether you have a button pushed down or not, because every frame it's going to say, is a button pushed? No, is a button pushed? No. But when I push, for example, up, it'll say a button is pushed, run this code in this if statement, now jump the player, for example. Or it will do like a countdown timer and things like that. So yeah, void start and void update. There are some other things. So for example, void awake. So void awake executes um, before start, and it's used for normally loading things up, like a loading screen when it builds up the whole scene and stuff like that. Then void start positions all the objects. To use void awake. Um, one thing that you can use, I think it's on exit. So when you leave, so say like you're making an app or like a thing on a particular device, you can write void exit. So when you leave the game, so here you hit escape and you exit it, it, for example, does a save, it pauses the game, it mutes the audio, things like that. So yeah, there's all these sort of pre-built functions that allow you to hold on, uh, basically access all these things. 
You can also write your own functions, which can be called from other points. So for example, I could write public void, um, I don't know, uh, walk the walk the dog. So that function I can call from another place. So when our player picks up the lead for a dog, I can then run functions saying walk the dog. It would then do all those things that are related to that function. So yeah, you can basically create your own methods and functions and you can also write use ones that are already preset. In this case, we want to hit a button like spacebar or like for example uh, the letter P or enter and things like that. It's going to create a queue. So we need to use update. So I'm going to get rid of start because we don't need that and we're just going to write all our code in update. But first we need to write some variables. We need to set some up things up at the top. So the first variable I'm going to use is public game object create prefab and another one public transform item spawn point. So two variables. So the first variable is going to store what we're going to create. It's basically going to store within memory at the beginning of the execution of this class the object that we're going to reference the project. This will make sense in a second, don't worry. The next one, we're going to store the transform, so the position or the rotation or the scale of a particular object. So in this case, the item spawn point. Then in update, we're going to say, when we push a key, get that first variable <coughs> and place, make a duplicate and place it at the position of the second variable, um, which we'll do right now. So in void update, as this is checking every frame, we can just write a very simple if statement saying if input dot get button, oh, get key down, So I know a lot of your programmers are probably sucking eggs a little bit, right? Do you guys know that saying, sucking eggs? No. It's like preaching to the choir. Yeah. How to write an if statement. Yeah. yeah. I won't explain what an if statement does. Yeah, <laughs> if this does this, do this. Yeah. So we're going to say if input, so it gets the input thing, get key down, and we do a particular thing. So in this case, pick something on your keyboard. So I'm going to do C for create, a crate, or a box, or whatever it may be or it could be D, or it could be space for spacebar, it could be enter, whatever you want. So I'm going to pick C for create, then we're going to run some code. In this case, we're going to create a crate. So we're going to go game object, created crate, equals instantiate. So instantiate is Unity's way of creating an object and adding it to the scene. So instantiate is a function that basically runs and whatever three things you pass into it, it will then do that particular thing. So what we're doing here is when we hit C, we're going to create this variable of game object. We're going to call it created create. So later on we can reference it, change its color, things like that. And we're going to equals instantiate. Then in here we need three particular values. So those who used Unity before, can you tell me what those three values are? So I'm really quizzing you guys. You get a gold star. Cool. I don't have any to hand out though, so yeah, I'm not as prepared. So yeah, so it's uh, what you are creating. So in this case, the prefab. Then next is going to be position it is created at. Then it's rotation it, oh, it is created at. So yeah, so for example, uh, our character is a stealth game. He walks into a room. And what we want to do is when he walks into this particular room, it spawns an enemy inside the room. So like it's time crisis style. So you come into the room, it spawns an enemy somewhere in the room, for example, behind a desk, rotated so it's facing the player. So in this case, you'd write something like um, enemy soldier um, spawn point dot position. And then, I don't know, you'd write some form of coordinates to face the door or face the player. So you might write like a coordinates or, you know, in the player's direction. So spawn point, rotation, if the spawn point's facing the door. So something like that. So in this case, we're, what we're spawning is create prefab. Where are we spawning at? Item spawn point dot position. Then what we need last is, hang on, I'm going to put that on a new line so you guys can see. What we need last is item spawn point dot rotation. So we're going to take the rotation of the spawn point and use that to rotate it. So for example, 
uh, this game where you walk into a room, it spawns enemy behind a desk, so he's kind of like tucked in there with his gun. We don't want him to be facing the wall, so like you walk in and he's facing like the other way, and he's like, oh, there you are, hi. We want him to be rotating in a particular way, so we need to pass all these things in. Then, just to add the icing onto the top of the cake, we have to write after that as game object. Because if you think about it, so if you think about it, if we take out that equals bit, all we're doing is writing instantiate, create prefab, item spawn point to position, and we have to tell it, tell Unity what we're creating it as. So for example, if we're creating an audio clip, we would instantiate it as an audio clip or something like that. In this case, it's basically stopping Unity from saying, okay, we're creating a create prefab, but what is it? A number, a texture. Whereas as game watch, it's like, aha, I know exactly what it's going to be. So I know it does seem like you're writing game objects several times, but okay. So yeah, we have written a very, probably the most simple thing you can write in Unity, which is quite cool. It's a nice building block to work upon. So creating, create, pre create, created, create as particular location. Save it and go back into Unity. So what you'll notice, actually, you didn't notice because it does it hilariously quick, which is not a good demo, is the bottom right hand corner of your scene, a little loading wheel will pop up every now and then. So say like you go in, you write, I'm not saying that you write 10,000 lines of code, then you go back into Unity. What that does is it's basically a compiler to check that there is no errors or check if there is errors or if there's things that are depreciated in this particular version, things like that. So if I, for example, right here, so I know all that code works fine. Oh, you notice the little spin wheel just popped up. So when I save it, oh, it's not going to do it, is it? The woes of demoing thing. So if I write, for example, public dog, so I haven't actually given it a type. When I go back into Unity, a little loading bar will pop up. Well, you'll notice that little red thing at the bottom. If it's red, that means it's bad and your game will not run. So I just wrote a function called public dog um, with no indication of what the dog is, an integer or a float. And what you'll notice is that I've written this error. When I click play, it will say all compilers have to be fixed before you can enter play mode. So basically, you can't run your game unless, unless all your code works and it's all fine. The only exception with that is null reference exception. So for example, uh, stuff hasn't come into play yet, so I, I'm trying to blow up a building that doesn't exist yet in the game. That stuff you wouldn't be able to test or debug until you're actually playing your game and you get to that particular point. What you'll notice is that it says you cannot run your game, it doesn't compile, you've got something dodgy somewhere. And I say, oh, okay, cool. So if you go to the window of console, it tells you basically it's like a debug list of all your errors, all your things. So you can output messages to this console, so for example, how much health the player has, what his distance is from other things. You can do it all from code. Uh, if there's a yellow uh, like exclamation mark in like a triangle, it's more like a recommendation as opposed to if this will not work. It's more like saying the texture compression you're using is perhaps a little too high to be built to a Windows phone. You're using textures that are probably aimed at more like a high-end PC. Perhaps compress it. It's kind of like perhaps you should do it this way as opposed to you will do it this way. Red is basically going to say, no, fix this stuff. So it's saying, unexpected symbol, semicolon, in class, struct, or interface member, declaration. But the useful thing about it is that it even tells you exactly where in your project your thing is going wrong. So rather than just saying, scenario, go find it, it's saying assets, forward slash scripts, forward slash item spawner. So it's told me the exact script it's got an error in. Then the first one is nine. So it's basically line nine of that script. So if I go into here, I'll say, all right, okay, what's the problem? Line nine, public dog. Oh, okay, I see. So sometimes it tells you things like you can't pass a float into an int, and then it's fairly obvious. Other times it's not too obvious. So I can say, okay, I'm going to get rid of that. Yeah, so if I go into here and double click it, it will then drum. Oh, okay, yeah, hang on. You waited till I untyped that, right? <laughs> so then if I go into here and say, okay, Celico got seven errors. If I double click that, it will then jump in. Okay, just to prove that it actually does do that. It should jump in, yeah, to that particular point. It does in Visual Studio, okay, yeah. That's what I get, right? <laughs> so yeah, basically it will jump to a particular line. So you're not completely left alone in the dark. It, the majority of you know these things are solvable. Another thing is it will give you errors. So error CS1519. I'd say every time I have an error, which I have no idea what it is, like I've written some dodgy code or something, Googling error CS1519 
will pop up Unity Answers and Unity Forums because it's got a lot, it's such, I mean, it's uh, quite easy to find all this stuff. And it will tell you exactly, and it will have an example that someone's previously had of this error, it will tell you how to fix it. So yeah, basically you're not completely left alone in the dark with an error like this. Majority of stuff you can search for or has been done by. So yeah, it's just saying recommendations, saying warning. We will create this assigned, but its value is never used. Okay, that's true, but I'm going to use it later on. So I can just click clear and tell it to go away, and I can run my game. What so. Yeah, so if you added breakpoint in, in um, we're going to go through that tomorrow. Uh, you can add in breakpoints so at certain points in the code, it will basically break it or pause it out or things like that. And you can debug through Visual Studio on your devices and stuff like that. So that's cool. Cool, so we have written some code. That's awesome. So if we go to our manager now, what you'll notice is that underneath the script, we now have a couple of variable slots. So these variable slots are where you assign things to be used. So, for example, if I go into here and I write public int, um, I don't know, number of crates, then I go into here, it checks, it compiles. I can then add in a number to be used. So, for example, I could write 100 crates in there. So, if I give this to a designer who doesn't want to see this has 1,300 lines of code and he goes, oh, I'm pretty scared right now. Like, what the heck does this all do? What you can do is you can give them this and... Basically, it will take in the, if you do camel, uh, camel caps like this, it will take it all in all these values and it will say, okay, I want 100 crates to spawn this time. I want the crate prefab to be this. So it's kind of like a visual representation of all your variables to drag and drop in. It's brilliant. Cool. Um, so if I do public color uh, crate color, it should give me a color picker so I can say set my color of my crate to be red which it already is but perhaps make it light blue over a certain amount of time uh, you can even have animation curves or not it might be anim curves I can't remember I'll check this later on but yeah basically you have the thing so any variable set as public will be viewed in the inspector. If I didn't want number of crates or the crate color to be public, so I don't want my designers to go in and start mucking around with stuff that shouldn't that I want to hard code in, just set them to be private. So if I say I don't want to give him free unit, I know he's working on the game, but I don't want him to muck around this, setting these variables to private, you can still use them, but when I go back in it'll basically hide them. So you can only sort of expose what you particularly want them to use. We're gonna be using this a bit later on after lunch when we do like a fruit Ninja clone, we fire fruit in the air, and I'm going to get you guys to play around different forces. So, whether it's too powerful with a force, or it's shooting out of the map, map, or like you know, basically tweaking these things. But at the moment, what we're doing is we have two variables. Well, four. I'll get rid of those. Creating one. When we hit spacebar, at position another. So what we need to do is we need to link them up. So we have these variables, but currently they're at none. Now, if I run my game and hit spacebar, nothing is happening. Except it says, oh, unsigned reference exception, the variable item spawn point of item spawn has not been signed, blah, blah, blah. That basically means it's trying to use something in this slot which hasn't actually been assigned. Nowhere in the code have we told a value to be a particular thing, and nowhere in the editor have we told a value to be a particular thing. So we need to link them up. So the simple thing to do that is you can either use a little target. So if you click the little target, it basically shows you all your assets in your project, and you can say, right, I'm now going to click the Q prefab. So you can see is Q prefab is now where the crate prefab is. So if you click Q prefab, what you'll notice is that it actually highlights in your project exactly what it's linked to. In this case, this. Item spawn point. Now we could use the little target to do that, or you can just go to cube spawn point and just drag and drop it into that particular slot there and let go. So what you should have now is Q prefab where the crate prefab is, the master object that's been stored. And item spawn point, the particular thing in the hierarchy there within our scene. And when we run our game and hit C, we have lots of boxes. Who's got boxes or who's not got boxes? Okay, Nikon, you did not. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And I always find unpredictable elements in games, not think about, I don't know how it's going to be coming or what sort of force it's going to be coming. Change the if statement, so instead of pushing C, creating a cube, you hold down C, it creates like billions of cubes. Okay, just basically get rid of the down bit. <laughs> So you can basically write, so get key down basically says when the button's pushed down. So for example, you push down to jump or down to change a button. Get key up is kind of like Angry Birds, like when you let go, it then it does a particular thing. If you just write get key, you can hold down C and it will just spawn lots because every frame it's constantly getting that you've got the button down. How's yours doing?